Welcome to the first session of day two. Uh, we're going to continue with uh, the basics of cryptography. In particular, we will look at AES and then the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol and then El Gamal encryption and El Gamal signatures. Along the way, I'd also like to just briefly talk about the definition of a group, which is very much used in cryptography and the definition of a field. So one of the nice things about AES is that it's a very simple algorithm, as we will soon see. So it turns out that around the end of the last century, uh, around 1995 or so, it became increasingly obvious that DES, the uh, algorithm that was used for secret key cryptography for several years, almost 40 years, was not very secure. There were various attacks on it, uh, brute force attacks, but also linear cryptanalysis, differential cryptanalysis, etc. And um, there was also triple DES, but the feeling was that uh, this had a limited time left before it became insecure. There were too many attacks on it and many of them were successful. Uh, it was necessary to come up with a more secure secret key algorithm, possibly with a larger block size. And then there was uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in the US solicited proposals for new secret key schemes. And there were many, many, many proposals, and they were filtered down finally to around five only. And these were proposals from all around the world. And of these five finalists, the one that finally made it was this, this uh, proposal by what's called the Rhinedale. There were actually two different people from an academic setting that came up with this algorithm. Let us see some of the good things about this. So the main selection criteria were, of course, security. It had to be highly secure. The cost in terms of computational complexity had to be decent, so you couldn't have something that takes too long to encrypt and decrypt. And also there were issues like the algorithmic and implementation characteristics. So it should be very simple to implement, to write the code for. Uh, it should work and should be implementable easily. That is, if you're writing it in assembly language for 8-bit microprocessors, 32-bit microprocessors, 64-bit microprocessors, you could implement it easily in hardware and so on and so forth. So there were a lot of different characteristics that people were looking out for, the judges were looking out for, including flexibility. Can it support multiple block sizes and multiple key sizes and so on? And finally, uh, this particular proposal that we call AES finally made it in the finals. The block size is 128 bits, but you can also increase the block size. The key size could be 128, 192, 256 and so on. The number of rounds Compared with DES, DES had 16 rounds. This thing has either 10 or 12 or 14, depending on whether the key size is 128, 192, or 256, respectively. And doesn't have the Feistel structure that DES, for example, had. So as mentioned before, the number of rounds in AES is 10. And each round involves four different operations, byte substitution, row shift, column mixing, and subkey addition. Useful to visualize the input block. So the block size, once again, at least for the most basic option, is 128 bits. You can have a higher block size and a higher key size, but let's just focus right now on the 128-bit option. So it's useful to visualize the plain text and the intermediate, the outputs at the intermediate stages as being 128 bits represented as a 4 by 4 byte array. So if you're talking about a 4 by 4 byte array, that's a total of 16 elements, and each element is a byte or 8 bits, so that gives you 128 bits. So the 128 bits in the block is represented as a 4 by 4 array of bytes, and each byte is two hex characters. What are the different steps? So the first step, now all of these different steps are rooted in mathematics, uh, primarily discrete mathematics, uh, field theory in particular. So let us get a brief background to what is a group and then what is a field. So let's start first with the definition of a group because we will need this in the context of Diffie-Hellman and then fields also in the context of elliptic curve cryptography and AES. So the first mathematical structure or the first discrete structure is the group and basically a group is two things. One is a set it could be a set of integers, it could be a set of permutations, it could be anything. A set and a particular operator, a generic operator called the group operator. And this group and this operator respect the following properties. 
closure, associativity, identity and inverse. So basically closure is if A and B belong to the group G then A star B star is the operator it is a generic operator A star B also belongs to G. Associativity for all A, B and C belonging to the group G it is the case that I can associate the brackets or the parentheses either this way or I can associate it this way and I get the same result. So this is A star in parentheses B star C close parentheses. The identity there exists a unique I belonging to G such that for all A belonging to G. A star i is equal to a and this is the same thing as i star a. So for all practical purposes all the groups that we discuss in the next 10 days in cryptography all have the property of in addition to this not all the groups will have this property but the groups that we are concerned with has this property of commutativity. that is so not all the groups in the world have this property but the groups of interest to us have this property of commutativity and finally the property of the inverse for all g belonging to big g there exists an element x such that x star g is equal to the identity and this g is referred to as the inverse of x and it is denoted as x inverse. If you have a multiplicative group if you have an additive group it is referred it is denoted as minus x. So it just depends on the context. So now these groups actually so this is once again a set and this is an operator these groups can be finite they can be infinite for our purposes we are mostly interested in finite groups. So for example one example of a group that we are very interested in is something like say z n with the operator. So this really refers to z n refers to the elements 0 1 2 3 right up to n minus 1. So we can very well verify suppose for example n is equal to 6 0 1 2 3 right up to 5 uh, these elements form a group with the operator addition modulo n or modulo 6 in this case. So this is one example and then you can verify that these properties hold closure if I take any two elements and I add them modulo 6 I get an element that belongs to the set say 3 plus 4 is 7 which is equal to 1 modulo 6 associativity 1 plus 2 plus 3 if I associate the parentheses with 1 plus 2 first I get 3 plus 3 6 and if I do it with 2 plus 3 so 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 5 1 plus 5 is also 6 so associativity trivially holds the identity of this set is 0 because I can add 0 to anything and I get back the original number. So 0 is the identity of this set and the inverse of this set. So the inverse of this set is the element which I say for example 4 plus something gives me 0 that something is minus 4 in modulo arithmetic that is the same thing as 2. So the inverse of 4 in this particular group is 2 the inverse of 3 will be 3 and so on. 
So this is one example of a group, the so-called additive group and finite group. Uh, probably the more interesting groups are um, where you have the operator being multiplication modulo n. So another example of a group would be something like So what is this notation? This is uh, this notation means all the integers between one and p minus one that are relatively prime to p. Relatively prime to p. Let us, for for simplicity, assume that p is prime. So in that case, let's take for example. So the set Z7 star now is this a group? So first and foremost associativity if I multiply two things together mod modulo 7 say 3 multiplied by 4 is 12 which is actually 5 modulo 7 I can multiply any two things and I get back something in that set associativity again trivially holds. 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 6 is the same thing as 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 6 and so on. So associativity holds the identity. If I multiply 4 by what will I get 4 back? If I multiply 4 by 1 I get 4 back. If I multiply 5 by 1 I get 5 back and so on. So the identity element is 1 and then finally the inverse. So does every element in this set have an inverse? So the inverse of 1 is 1 because 1 multiplied by 1 is 1. The inverse of 2 is it 3, is it 2, is it 4. So 2 multiplied by 4 is 8 which is 1 modulo 7. So the inverse of 4 will also be 2. Then the inverse of 3. 3 5s are 15 which is 14 plus 1. So the inverse of 3 is 5 and the inverse of 5 is 3 and then 6 looks like the inverse of 6 should be 6. 6 multiplied by 6 is 36 which is 1 modulo 7. So each element has an inverse. So this is another very important group. These are all multiplicative groups and we will use this when we talk about Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So these are some of the important finite groups that we consider. This particular group is referred to as a prime group because the number here is a prime number. You can verify it on your own that this thing for example does not constitute a group. Z6 star first and foremost the elements of this would be so if I just take Z6 that is all the elements from so actually I will just rewrite this as Z6 minus 0. So this is the set 1 2 3 right up to 5. Now this thing fails to be a group because some elements do not have an inverse for example what is the inverse of 3? 3 multiplied by what will give me 1 modulo 6? Nothing. So this thing fails to be this particular set Z6. Z6 is all the elements from 0 through 5. So Z6 minus the 0 element that is all these elements without the 0. This thing is not a group unlike in this case. This is Z7 star that is Z7 without the 0 and this thing forms a group but this thing does not form a group. So we need to understand clearly what forms a group and what is not a group. The next thing that we need to so this is a very brief background on groups uh, details of this thing are in the textbook there is an entire chapter on mathematical background for cryptography the basic mathematical background for cryptography. In addition to groups another very important structure is that of a field. So very very briefly a two minute introduction to fields uh, what is a field it is a set just like in the case of a group you had a set and instead of just one operator you have two generic operators a plus and a star. It really depends on whoever is defining the group 
to define these operators. It doesn't have to necessarily be the kind of operator that we are familiar with. The plus doesn't have to have the same meaning as it does in simple arithmetic. So a plus and a star. For example, this set F could include things like matrices for example. And then this could be matrix operations like matrix addition and matrix multiplication. So in the case of a group, what uh, a very simple introduction to a, uh, to a field is that you will find that the F together with plus this thing constitutes a group. This is called the additive group of the field and likewise if you just take F without the zero element that is the additive identity. Interestingly enough this also forms a group and this is called the multiplicative group of this field. The two groups of most interest to us in cryptography are groups where so there is a theorem that says that the number of elements in a field should either be a prime number or a power of a prime number. And the two fields of interest to us in cryptography are prime fields and so called binary fields where p is equal to 2. So a special case of this thing where p is equal to 2 such fields are known as binary fields. One other important thing about the field is that you have a property called distributivity besides associativity and uh, closure and so on which are actually subsumed over here in this thing and in this you also have the property of distributivity. So for all A, B and C it is true that A star B, A star B plus C is equal to So this property in it holds in addition to these things. So for simplicity just think of these two things and this property of distributivity as being part of the attributes of a field. Now a prime, a prime field is simply the elements for example Z7. This would be a prime field the elements would be 0 through 6. So this would constitute a field with the operations being addition modulo 7 and multiplication modulo 7. So these are the kinds of fields I am talking about when I say prime fields which are useful in cryptography. And the other field which we are going to encounter very soon now are these binary fields. So the number of elements in a binary field is always 2 to the power of an integer. So you can have a field for example of size 4, of size 8, of size 16 but not something of size 15. Now the way we represent the elements of the binary field are as binary strings. So this is one representation you can represent them as polynomials as well with binary coefficients but one representation of the elements are binary strings. of length n. So in the context of AES the binary field that we are interested in is the so called field GF2 raised to 8 it has 256 elements. And as I mentioned before each element is a binary string of length 8. So for example in element of this field would be something like this and we typically represent this thing in our discussion of AES as two hex characters. So this character is the number 10 and this is 3. So this is element A3. So this is just a preliminary introduction to introduce fields so that we can understand how AES actually works. So once again the block size in AES
128 bits. I just mentioned that we can represent this in a matrix form a 4 by 4 matrix there are 4 elements in each row and there are 4 rows. So all these 128 bits fit inside this so 16 elements and each element will be 8 bits like this so each element would be 2 hex characters for example B6, A3 and so on and so forth and we operate on each of these elements. So let us see what are those operations I just mentioned there is something called byte substitution there is something called column mixing shift row shift and so on and so forth let us look at each of those things in detail next. So let us just back up a little bit I was talking about AES and then I just digressed to introduce these two important discrete structures namely the group and the field. So I said AES encryption at least the version we are going to consider today has got 128 bits as the block size and 128 bits as the key size. There are 10 rounds in this thing each round comprises the following 4 steps byte substitution, row shift, column mixing and sub key addition. Once again it is useful to visualize the input block once again the block size is 128 bits it is useful to visualize these 128 bits as an array a 4 by 4 array of bytes each byte is 2 hex characters. So the first step is byte substitution so what exactly happens over here so we said last uh, yesterday's uh, lecture that one of the important operations is substitution and the other is transposition or permutation. So in byte substitution you have a substitution table so in this case the substitution table is a 16 by 16 s box or table where the i jth entry s i j so if I want to know what is the i jth entry i ranges from 0 through 15 and j ranges from 0 through 15 so it is a total of 256 elements in this s box so it has been very carefully designed by these guys and what is the value in the i jth entry the value there is nothing else but suppose I want to know what is the value in the fourth row and the third column I just put 4 over here in hexadecimal and 3 in hexadecimal so 4 3 put it represent it so 2 hexadecimal characters which is 8 bits and then I, I know that these 8 bits represents one field in the field I just talked about of 256 elements I take the inverse value of that so inversion is defined because the multiplicative group uh, has an inverse by definition of a group so I take the inverse of that element and then I exclusive or so this is exclusive or with the hexadecimal value 63 so this is one byte or 8 bits 63 which is 0 1 1 0 and 3 which is 0 0 1 1 so I take the inverse of that element of this value what is ij i is the index into the array the row index into this 16 by 16 s box and j is the column index I concatenate the two of them so this is 4 bits because there are 16 rows so to represent a row I need 4 bits to represent a column I need 4 bits so 4 bits for 4 bits is 8 bits which is an element of gf 2 raised to 8 the field of 256 elements I take the inverse of that field of that element and then I exclusive all with the element 6 3 so ij is a concatenation of i and j represented as binary strings ij inverse is the multiplicative, multiplicative inverse of ij in the multiplicative group operations are defined in gf2 raised to 8 and just like for a prime field I need a prime number uh, to act as the modulus over here I need something called an irreducible polynomial and the irreducible polynomial is this value the details are in the textbook so we do not have time to discuss this in great detail it will take about an hour so I will just skip the details of the actual operation of multiplication in a multiplicative group and the operation of inversion in a multiplicative group and finally the element uh, row 0 and column 0 I would have to put 0 and 0 over here and take the inverse of the 0 element but there is no inverse for the 0 element so for that particular special case what I do is I simply substitute hexadecimal value 6 3 as the element in row 0 column 0 of the s box so this is my first step what is the step I have got 
16 elements inside this um, matrix it is a 4 by 4 matrix which represents the block I have got 16 elements in that matrix so do not confuse between that matrix and this 16 by 16 matrix let us go back to this page so in this page over here I represent the 128 bits in the block as a matrix of 4 by 4, a 4 by 4 matrix and each element in this matrix is a single byte of 8 bits and now what do I do if I want so I have to do a substitution so the way I do a substitution is I take each and every of these elements and I substitute it for some element from the S box so to obtain the element I am going to substitute this thing by something so what do I do is I look at the big fat S box which has got 16 by 16 elements the S box and this is the row index so I take the bth row of this matrix and then I take the sixth column of this matrix and wherever they intersect I substitute that value in this place so maybe I will just show it again in a picture. the first step in each round is the byte substitution step so what I do is I have got these 128 bits represented as a 4 by 4 matrix let us say this element is A3 now what do I substitute this for so this is the 4 by 4 array and then I have got the 16 by 16 S box so what do I do is I take this A and I use it as a row index so the first row is row 0 the second row is row 1 the last row is row F this is row A and then number 3 over here I look at the third column I look at the third column and I see what is the element over there and whatever is that element those two hex characters will be substituted over here so this is the substitution step and I will do this for each and every single element inside this array so that is my first step by its substitution so that is just a description of what I illustrated on this sheet the step the second step is quite straightforward it is called row shifting so each element in the ith row of the state array undergoes a left circular shift of i positions the row shift causes bytes in a column to be diffused among other columns so the purpose of this whole thing is basically a transposition so the first step was substitution the second step is transposition so once again in a picture so in the first step I substituted each of these values using the S box in the second step I will perform a row shift so the first row does not get shifted but the second row gets shifted by one position this the third row gets shifted by two positions the fourth row by four positions and so on so everything is shifted left so that is the transposition operation called row shift so the effect of this is that the bytes in a column are diffused amongst other columns a diffusion kind of operation the next operation is column mixing so this is a very interesting operation the original state so the state means the 4 by 4 matrix that keeps getting operated upon and changing as we go through the different steps of this uh, algorithm so the uh, state is the input to this step this column mixing step the input is a 4 by 4 matrix that thing is pre multiplied by this 4 by 4 matrix so you have got two 4 by 4 matrices that are multiplied this thing is multiplied by 
the input to the step the input to the step itself is a 4 by 4 matrix. So that 4 by 4 matrix keeps getting transformed as we go step by step and these things this multiplication is a special kind of multiplication a field multiplication and each of these things is to be interpreted as a field element. So these are two hex characters this is not the simple number 2 and 3 but these are actually two hex characters so this really represents the field element 0 0 0 0 the first hex character and the next hex character is 2 0 0 1 0 this thing is 0 0 0 0 and 0 0 1 1. So this is the thing that is multiplied by the state matrix to give you the output of this round of this step. So this step is the column mixing step now very interestingly if you go on doing these four steps again and again and again and again you will find that after a few rounds so a particular output the ciphertext is just being formed and a particular output will depend on all the inputs in the plain text which is a very important property called diffusion. So this is the third step and then we have got a fourth step which is round key addition. So each round has a separate key obtained from the original key using a key expansion algorithm again the details of this thing are in the text. So you have the original key which is a 128 bit key and from that 128 bit key you derive 10 different round keys which are going to be used for the 10 different rounds. So each of those round keys once again because it is 128 bits can be represented as a 4 by 4 matrix of bytes and you simply take the state matrix that 4 by 4 thing that has been obtained as an input to this round and you take this uh, round key which is again a 4 by 4 matrix and you simply add the two when I say add I mean field addition which in this case happens to be the exclusive or. So you take element by element and you exclusive or them. So this completes the four rounds of AES. Uh, we will return to AES to look at how we can attack this using something called a side channel attack. So we will do this probably uh, later next week. So with that little introduction I move on to the next part of this, uh, this particular talk which is the discrete log problem and Diffie Hellman. So this is the second session on basic cryptography we have just looked at the operation of AES and looked at all the field operations along the way we very briefly described what is a group and then what is a field. So we now move on to a very important problem in cryptography called the discrete logarithm problem just like the factorization problem is very hard this is another problem that is very hard and upon which the security of several signature algorithms depends this is the discrete log problem we will define the problem and then we look at various applications of this. So let p be a prime number and let g be a primitive root of p so just think of the uh, set 1 2 3 4 up to p minus 1 and just let us think of uh, a bit so this thing was going to be a group that is the set 1 2 3 up to p minus 1 with the operation multiplication modulo p so this is the set and this is the group and let g be a generator of this group so uh, let me just define what is a generator a generator is an element of the group which can generate all the other elements by performing that operation repeatedly on itself so let us take an example of this so let us consider the group z7 star with the operation multiplication modulo 7. the elements of this group are now let us take some arbitrary element let us say 2 so I start with 2 then I go on to 2 star 2 then I go on to 2 star 2 star 2 and so on and I ask myself the question have I generated all of these elements in the process. So the first element was just 2 the second element is 4 the next element is 2 4 8 and um, uh, multiply these three things modulo 7 and I get 1 so I find that 2 is not a generator because now when I find a number repeated over here and this number will keep repeating 
so this is not a generator of this group let us try 3 9 is the same thing as 2 I am sorry so this is the next one is 6 multiplied by 3 so that is 18 mod 7 So, do I get all the elements over here? I get the element 3, I get the element 2, 3 3 is 9, which is 2, then 2 3 is 6, 6 3 is 18, mod 7, that is 4, 4 3 is 12, mod 7, that is 5, 5 3 is 15, mod 7, I get 1. So, I see that I get all the elements in this case. So, 3 happens to be a generator, while 2 is not a generator. So, I am really referring now to elements of this type. So, first and foremost in Diffie Hellman I need to define the group something like this and I need to define a generator. So, this thing is a parameter of Diffie Hellman what we call P. So, I am really looking for groups like this where p is a prime number so that is the first parameter and then I am looking for the next parameter which is g a generator in this group an example of a generator is 3. Okay, so, with that background let us look at how Diffie Hellman works. So, let be p be a prime number and let g be a generator in this group. So, what that means is g then g star uh, g star g mod p g star g star g mod p and so on and so forth. So, do this 3 times do this 4 times and so on and you will soon see that you get all the elements inside that group z p star. Then and only then we say g is a primitive root or g is a generator of that group. So, first and foremost we define p and we define g then the function f a which is equal to g raised to a mod p is called the modular exponentiation function with base g and modulus p. So, this particular operation you have seen before in the context of RSA this is relatively straightforward, but the reverse operation where you are given g and p and now you are given a and you want to find out. So, log of p to the base g it is inverse a is equal to log of p to the base g is called the discrete logarithm problem. So, if you are given this number over here. So, there is a misprint over here if you are given this number and you have to find out a. So, there are two different problems the exponentiation problem where you are given p and g in both cases you are given g and p. In the first case you are given a and you need to find this entire thing. In the second case once again you are given g and p, but you are given this thing and you need to find out a. So, this problem is referred to as the discrete log problem and this is infeasible if you choose the group and the generator appropriately. So, I will just repeat again you are given the prime number p and so you are given the group z p star with operation multiplication modulo p. So, you are given that and you are able to find a generator how exactly we would not discuss over here, but you are able to find a generator of that group z p star. Then furthermore if you are given a and you are asked to find out g raise to a mod p then this operation is referred to as modular exponentiation and it is relatively straightforward using uh, tricks like um, square and multiply. 
on the other hand if you were given this thing itself so the inverse that is log of f of a this is not p this is log of f of a modulo p so this reverse operation where you are given p and g and this thing and you are asked to find a is a difficult problem and that is referred to as the discrete log problem so some examples of this i am taking a, a set z29 star it's got 28 elements as you can see 2 raised to 1 2 raised to 2 and so on and that is 2 raised to 28 out there i hope it's visible so you take 2 raised to 1 that is 2 2 raised to 2 is 4 8 and so on and you find that this number 2 is a generator because it generates all the elements in that group z29 star all the 28 elements so you won't find a repeat out here as you go along the first one is 2 4 8 16 3 6 12 24 and so on all the elements between 1 and 28 will be encountered as we go along this circle now suppose you are given the number say for example you are given the number uh, this is 2 raised to 1 2 3 4 5 you are given the number 5 it is easy to compute 2 raised to 5 modulo 29 but suppose you are given a number 9 then to compute this in general is infeasible so if you are given the number 9 to compute the number x so that 2 raised to x is equal to 9 modulo 29 that is a difficult problem which is called the discrete log problem especially when so for a small uh, set of numbers like in this case it is easy but when this number gets to be very large then this problem becomes infeasible so the discrete log problem becomes infeasible in that case and when I say this number is large I mean that you require something like a thousand bits to represent that number so it is something of the order of 2 raised to 1000 so one example which is less trivial let us suppose we have got the prime number 131 so z131 star is the group with the operation multiplication modulo 131 and this happens to be a generator it is not always that g equals 2 is a generator so it turns out in this case that 2 is a generator then you can actually compute this uh, by using a little program the discrete logarithm of 72 uh, to, to the base 2 modulo 131 is actually 17 and the reason this is true is that 2 raised to 17 modulo 131 is 72 so if you were given 17 then to compute this is straightforward but if you are given 72 in general to compute this would be much less straightforward so this is the discrete log problem and this is modular exponentiation so with that brief background to uh, the discrete log problem let us look at some of the applications the first application which most of you are familiar with is Diffie-Hellman key exchange uh, then there is also Diffie-Hellman authentication and we will also try to cover in this session uh, El Gamal encryption and El Gamal signatures so once again most of you are familiar with this this was an algorithm or actually a protocol the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol that came up in the year 1976 uh, by these two gentlemen Diffie and Hellman the problem is the two sides needs, need to exchange a key securely so they need to come up with a common session key assume they have already agreed on a P and a G if they have not agreed then A can decide on it and just send it to B so let us just see how this would work then so let us look at a picture you have got A here and you have got B over here so what A does is it chooses an appropriate prime number P a very large number thousands of bits long and a generator for that group and then she also chooses an ephemeral secret so this is her ephemeral secret A which she sends across so she does not actually send A she computes G raised to A mod P and sends it across so that A is like a private key and G raised to A mod P is like a public key so she sends across the parameters p g and her public key g raised to a mod p and the other party b what he does is he correspondingly chooses an integer b between 0 and p minus 1 and then computes g raised to b mod p and sends that thing across so g raised to b mod p is sent across and then when she receives his public key she computes uh, g raised to b mod p to the power of her private key a 
this whole thing modulo p and the result that she gets is g raised to a b mod p and what he does is when he gets her public key g raised to a mod p he raises that to the power of his private key b so he gets the same value g raised to a b mod p and nobody knows this value except the two of them so this becomes the common session key that they will use to encrypt all the messages between them for the duration of this session so why does diffie hellman key exchange work so the simple bit of uh, algebra over here uh, let's see what she computes she's got her public she's got his public key which is g raised to b mod a so once again his private key which he just chose and didn't tell anyone about is b and he computed his public key g raised to b mod p and sent it to her and then when she gets it she raises it to the power of her secret her private key so this is the computation she performs she takes his public key and raises it to the power of her secret and she gets g raised to a b mod p and this is exactly the same thing as the public key that she gave b and b took it and raised it to the power of his secret so now both sides get the same value g raised to a b mod p so here's a little example which you can try uh, offline uh, i've taken p equals 131 and generated 2 and uh, let the secret that she chooses be the value 24 so her public key becomes 2 raised to 24 mod 131 which is 46 so she sends 46 to him and he chooses 17 as his secret computes 2 raised to 17 mod uh, 131 which is 72 and he sends this to her and after receiving a b's partial key she computes the value 72 the value that she got from him raised to her private key which is 24 which she chose or generated in this step so she computes this value mod 131 which is 13 this is the secret that she comes up with and he comes up with exactly the same secret because he takes the value received from her which is 46 the value that she gave him and uh, he takes it and raises that value to his private key 17 which he generated in this step so 46 raised to 17 mod 131 is 13 both sides have agreed on a common secret which they will use to encrypt all messages between them for the duration of this session So let's look at a possible attack on the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. So choose A as before, and she computes G raised to A mod P. She sends the uh, parameters P, G, the prime number, the generator, and G raised to A mod P across to him. Now there's a man in the middle attack. Attack over here. The attacker stands in the middle. Notice what he's doing. He captures the entire message. There's an active attack, not just a passive attack. he captures the uh, message and replaces g raised to a mod p with his own g raised to c mod p so he chooses a c he computes g raised to c mod p and he replaces g raised to a mod p with g raised to c mod p and he sends the same thing across to him he innocently does this, does what a did uh, chooses a b computes g raised to b mod p and sends it across once again the attacker is in action he intercepts that g raised to b mod p and replaces it with g raised to c mod p so what happens is she thinks that the g raised to c mod p came from b but actually what b intended to send was g raised to b mod p and that was modified by the attacker and replaced by g raised to c mod p so she takes g raised to c mod p and raises it to the power of her private key so she gets g raised to a c mod p and he does exactly the same thing at that end he computes his secret as g raised to bc mod p so the secrets that this one and this one have uh, computed are completely different so guess what happens after this now every single message goes from him uh, from her to him but it again is intercepted by this guy so what he does is he gets the message now this is encrypted with the key that he knows which is g raised to ac mod p this is g raised to ac mod p and he has also computed the same value because he has taken the g raised to a mod p that she sent and raised it to the power of his secret c so he gets g raised to ac mod p and every single message that is encrypted with that key he intercepts he decrypts he reads it and reencrypt maybe modifies it and reencrypts it with the key that he shares between him and b 
which is g raised to b c mod p. So, re encrypts it and sends it across. So, it is a very active attack because he is doing a lot of work intercepting, decrypting, modifying and re encrypting and sending it back. The same thing when you receive something from him and so on and so forth. So, this is a standard man in the middle attack. So, one question is what can we do about this attack? How can we prevent this attack? So, the way to prevent this is to authenticate whatever parameters are being sent. So, perhaps digitally sign all the parameters that are being sent by A and the parameters being sent by B. All of this message needs to be digitally signed by A so that B can verify it. Whatever is B is sending should be digitally signed by B so that A can verify it. Then the man in the middle attack will not be possible. So, that kind of uh, scheme is known as authenticated Diffie Hellman key exchange. Okay, so, from key exchange to authentication. So, we can use this uh, idea of the discrete log to actually do to do encryption. So, once again you have a large prime p and a generator in this group z p star with operation multiplication modulo p. Now, what is the private key in this case and what is the public key? So, an L gamma private key is an integer a. So, choose some random integer a between 1 and p minus 1. Once again the value of p is a very very large integer which requires about 1000 bits for example to represent. It is a very large integer which occupies 1000 bits at least 1000 could be thousands. So, that is her private key that she chooses. The corresponding public key is a triplet where you have got the parameters, the prime number, the generator and alpha where alpha is obtained from g raised to a mod p. So, this is the public key of this person with corresponding private key a. Now, let us see how encryption would work L gamma encryption where we make use of this idea of the discrete log. So, once again p g and alpha is the public key of a this triplet to encrypt a message m to be sent to a. So, b wants to send this message encrypted with her public key he wants to send it to her. So, what he does is he chooses a random number r lying between 1 and p minus 1 for security reasons that number has to be relatively prime to p minus 1 you can show that if you do not have this condition satisfied there could be a security lapse. And then b computes two integers very interesting the cipher text is now two integers not just one integer as an in RSA. The first integer is g raised to r mod p and the second integer is it has to obviously <coughs> use the public key of a. So, b uses alpha from a's public key. So, this whole thing is given by a to b possibly in the form of a certificate and b pulls out the alpha uses it over here. So, he has generated this random number r he uses the same random number r and as an index he chooses alpha from her public key. So, alpha to the power of r multiplies it by his message and then reduces it modulo p and that is the second constituent of the cipher text. So, the first one is c 1 and the second one is c 2 b sends the cipher text c 1 c 2 to a. Now, the interesting question is how would you decrypt this? So, actually it is very straightforward something tells you that to decrypt it you need to use the private key. So, a will have to use her private key which is little a. So, to decrypt the cipher text c 1 c 2 a uses a private key little a and computes. So, the first part of the message was if you recall g raised to r. So, g raised to r now to the power of minus a a private key and then multiplied by c 2 the second part of the mess of the cipher text which was the message multiplied by a public key raised to the power of r. So, that is c 2. So, this is what we state this operation we state will help to recover the message m. Let us see why this works c 1 to the power of minus a multiplied by c 2 mod p this is nothing else but g raise to r mod p raise to the power of minus a that is this stuff. And the second thing is nothing else, but what he computed which is m times alpha raise to r mod p. So, this thing is g raise to minus a r if you use the laws of uh, modulo arithmetic g raise to minus a r and then this thing is alpha do not forget is g raised to a. So, I am just substituting g raised to a and then raising it to the power of r. So, I get g raised to a r and then this m is over here now g raised to minus a r g raised to a r cancel out and I just get m mod p and that is the original message m. 
So this is how decryption works case of the El Gamal system. So there are some questions is El Gamal secure. So what is one possible way so now you can think of some very smart ways of recovering the uh, private key or the uh, message from the cipher text. So one idea that comes to mind is I know that C2 is equal to m times alpha to the power of r C2 was m times alpha to the power of r. So what I do is I just write it down as I just put m on one the other side and I get m is equal to C2 to the power of alpha raised to the power of minus r. And how do I get r I know that r is related to C1 so these two things are part of the cipher text. So I know that C1 is g raised to r mod p and I solve the discrete log problem and I try to recover r. Once I recover r I use it over here I know C2 I know her public key and now I have recovered r from this so I do this operation and I get the message in. So this is what the hacker thinks where is the hacker wrong the hacker thinks he can just obtain m using this solving the discrete log problem but that is precisely what we have said from the beginning the discrete log problem is very hard it is very infeasible if you choose the appropriate large group. So in that appropriate large group it is virtually impossible to solve the discrete log problem if I know this I know this and I know this it is impossible to get r r is the discrete log of C1 to the base G modulo P that problem is impossible so it was impossible for me to get r how can I compute this and get back the key. So the hacker cannot get m only the person with knowledge of the private key little a can obtain the value of m as shown before in the previous slide. We were talking about El Gamal encryption and we were trying to hack into the scheme and we found that one hack involved uh, computing the discrete log which is infeasible. Let us consider a second hack which is based on the vulnerability over here is the way this protocol is implemented. If you use the same random number repeatedly then there is a chance of being able to obtain the cipher text let us see why. So these are the two equations we wrote down now suppose I use the same random number twice. So I have two different messages m and m prime and now I have got two pairs of cipher text c1 prime and c2 prime So let us see the things that I know I know what is P I know what is G and I can see the cipher text. Now let us suppose I know that this is equal to this so the uh, software that does the encryption has used the same random number twice so even though the messages are different. So this value C2 is different from this value C2 prime this message M is different from M prime however C1 is the same as C1 prime that probably suggests that they are using the same random number. Now I know what is C2 and C2 prime and I would like to find out as a hacker what is the value of M prime. Let us suppose uh, the hypothetical case where I also know M such an attack is known as a known plain text attack. Where I happen to know one or more message cipher text pairs so let us suppose I happen to know the value of m the question is is it possible to know the value of m prime on the assumption that the software is buggy and uses the same random number repeatedly. So now I am trying to find out m prime given that I know C2 and given that the random number that was chosen for both the encryptions is the same. So if I look at this equation C2 is equal to m times alpha to the power of r mod p 
and this alpha raised to the power of r is the same thing. So I can write down from here alpha raised to r is equal to C2 m inverse mod p and this is the same thing as looking at this thing alpha raised to r is C2 prime m prime inverse. Now if you look at these two equations we know this we know this and we know this therefore I can find out m prime inverse and I can find out m prime. So m prime is equal to C2 prime times C2 inverse times m. So this is the attack knowing the cipher texts which I always know so I can always tap into the line and find the values of the cipher texts. The thing is I want to find out what is this message m prime that the, uh, the victim has uh, just encrypted and sent. I am assuming a known plain text attack where I happen to know the value of m for this encryption. So now from this equation I get alpha raised to r is equal to c2 times m inverse and from this equation alpha raised to r is equal to c2 prime times m prime inverse. So I equate these two and I am able to solve for m. So for m prime, m prime is equal to c2 prime times c2 inverse times m. So the model of the story is do not repeat the same random number twice. Recall once again that I use a random number in computing the cipher text c1 is equal to g raised to r I am talking about this r g raised to r and c2 is equal to m to the power of the public key to the power of r do not repeat this random number twice in two different encryptions. So this is in words what I just explained on the sheet of paper and this is a simple example let p be 131 and the generator be 2 just choose a, a private key a chooses a private key a equals 97 a public key is 2 raised to 97 mod 131 which is 14 let the message to be sent be 75. Now the sender chooses a random number let us say it is 33 and then he does exactly those computations g raised to r so 2 raised to 33 mod 131 which is 103 and this thing m is 75 alpha is 14 and the random number is the same thing over here 33 and this is 51. So the cipher text corresponding to the message 75 is two numbers 103 and 51. So El Gamal encryption actually doubles the amount of space for the cipher text. And then we simply uh, perform this thing algebraically C1 to the power of minus A. So to, in order to decrypt the private key is necessary so the private key is 97 so 103 to the power of minus 97 multiplied by 51 mod 131 and the answer is 75 so you recover the original message ok and the final thing about uh, the discrete log can we use it to actually perform to generate and to verify signatures so how do we do that once again let a be the private key of uh, this person a and let her public key be the different parameters prime number the generator and alpha where alpha is equal to g raised to a mod p to sign a message m she does the following she computes the hash of the message h of m we talked about the cryptographic hash yesterday so she computes h of m then once again she chooses a random number r such that r is relatively prime to p minus 1 she computes x is equal to g raised to r mod p just like in the case of encryption the case of signatures too this thing is computed the first part of the signature and the second number she computes y as the hash of the message minus she takes a private key a multiplies it by this component of the signature performs this and then multiplies that by the inverse of the random number mod of p minus 1 so note this over here it is not p but it is p minus 1 and now the signature is the pair x and y now the question is so this is signature generation notice that she has used her private key anytime you uh, sign you have to use your private key so she's used her private key and then to verify it uh, the verifier will use the corresponding public key so x and y were the two components of the message what the other guy that is b does is he takes the x raises it to the power of y 
then takes her public key raises it to the power of x. So x and y are the two components of the signature and reduces this modulo p and uh, then verifies whether this thing is the same as g to the power of the hash of the message and you can try and do it on your own otherwise see section 8.3.2 of the text for proof of why this verification equation holds. So what does he have to do I want to make sure that this is really the signature of A on this document M the document is M the message is M what I should do is I should compute the receiver or the verifier must compute H of M raise G to the power of H of M and see whether this thing mod P is the same thing as the two components of the signature pull them out X raised to the power of Y multiplied by her public key alpha which is typically contained in a certificate to the power of X and see whether this thing reduced modulo P is the same thing as this, this thing reduced modulo P. If it is the case then we say that the signature has been verified it is an authentic signature. So with this I will end the discussion of the discrete log there were some questions that had come from the remote sites I will also try to answer them maybe I can do some of them right away. So one question was about I have written uh, I have used the notation Z7 and then Z7 star what is the difference between these two things and how many elements are there in Z7 and Z7 star. So usually this notation Z7 really refers to the set of elements. So there are seven elements in this Z7 star does not include the 0. So it has got only 6 elements so I just want to point out that this thing is a special case of Z this thing need not always be prime I mean I can consider for a group I can consider an arbitrary number n here arbitrary integer n but then I have to use the correct definition the definition of this thing is all the integers x x lying between 1 and n minus 1 such that gcd of x and n is equal to 1 as an example of this I can define z8 star and z8 star with the operation multiplication modulo 8 is also a group so this thing will be 1 I cannot put 2 over there because it has to be the GCD has to be 1 so choose all the numbers between 1 and 7 that are relatively prime to 8 so 2 is not relatively prime 3 is 4 is not 5 is 6 is not 7 is so these are the elements 1 3 5 and 7. So this also forms a group it does not have to be prime but if I put a prime number then the elements of that set will be everything from 1 to p minus 1 well here you will be skipping some of the elements. So how many elements in z7 star the answer is 6 how many, how many elements in z7 the answer is 7 how many elements in z8 the answer is 8 elements how many elements in z8 star answer is 4 in fact uh, when we considered RSA when we talked about RSA uh, Zn star where n is the modulus which is the product P multiplied by Q Zn star is precisely the cardinality of this set is precisely this thing phi or phi of n which is p minus 1 times q minus 1 in this special case the n is the product of 2 primes ok there was another question about the uh, multiplicative inverse in the set z 7 star I made a mistake as I was writing so I will just clarify that the inverses so this is not there the inverse of 1 the inverse of 2 2 multiplied by 4 is 1 it is actually 8 but reduced modulo 7 it is 1 likewise the inverse of 4 is 2 they have to be inverses of each other 
the inverse of 3 is it 3 no is it 5 yes 3 5 is a 15 which is 1 modulo 7 likewise here 3 and I by mistake I put 1 over here 6 multiplied by what gives me 1 6 multiplied by 6 is 36 which is 1. So, the inverse of 6 is not 1, but it is 6 the inverse of 1 is 1. Okay, then there was another question this is from the remote sites there was another question of how many rounds. are necessary in a secret key cipher. So, we have seen that in the case of DES there are 16 rounds in the case of AES you can have 10 you can have 12 you can have 14 and so on. So, why 10 and why not 8 why not 6 and the answer is this thing the number of rounds this is a security parameter ask yourself the question we know how desk works suppose I have a hypothetical desk which has just two rounds a two round AES construct this give this as an example or exercise to your students ask them to look at the vulnerabilities in two round AES is it vulnerable if so to what extent is 3 round AES vulnerable if so to what extent. So, you will find that as you increase the number of rounds the amount of diffusion increases and pretty much then you will find the cipher text is dependent on every single value of the plain text this is a very important statement that the each bit of the cipher text take any bit of the cipher text bit 5 it is dependent on all the bits of the plain text if you use say for example, 3 rounds and 4 rounds. So, the more rounds you use the more the diffusion of course, there is a trade off which I mentioned on the first day in the first lecture one important security principle is a trade off between security and performance. So, I might get more performance by increasing the number of rounds, but at the cost of security. So, the in incremental in improvement in security is very little and I have got to pay a heavy price in terms of performance. So, I stop at some number and after some research I figure out that probably the safe number to stop at in terms of number of rounds is 10. So, that is why the standard has 10 rounds in the case of AES and in the case of DES perhaps they were a little paranoid the number of rounds is 16. Once again you can give this as an exercise to your students ask them to look at the vulnerabilities in 2 round DES and see whether you can crack 2 round DES hypothetical secret key cipher. So, I think we are running out of time a little bit there is a presentation on Wireshark. So, I will stop over here and continue later on with this thing.